Okay, can you hear me? All right, good. All right, like welcome everyone here this morning. Thank you for coming out and being with us this morning. Uh, before we get started, I've asked our brother Mark Colson to lead us in an opening prayer. Let's all bow. Most kind and gracious, Father in heaven, we're indeed thankful to you for this, another day that you've given us, another day this side of eternity. To worship and praise you. We're thankful for this avenue of prayer that we can do that. Thank you, Father, for the Bible and your word. Without it, we'd be lost. And we can look into the past and know what we're supposed to do in the present and have that hope for what's there in the future. Thank you for this congregation that's been established and may it always stand for that, what is true. Thank you for the desire of each and every one that's here this morning that we might learn more and study more. And that the ones that present in the lesson will, will have clear understanding and Present it in a way we can understand it and use it and be stronger by being here today. We ask you to forgive us of our shortcomings and help us to search for that way out when we're tempted and be with the sick, especially this number, that they might have speedy recoveries and, and uh, be with us throughout this lesson the rest of our, this day. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Joey and I'd like to thank you guys for choosing this class. We know you had a lot of options. And we're glad that you chose to be in our class this morning. Uh, we are looking at New Testament characters. Now, one of the things you're going to learn about me is I walk. Uh, but because of social distancing, I will not walk up the aisles. I will walk all over up here. Who knows where I'll wind up. I know the camera hates that, but nothing I can do about that. I, I, can't, I can't do that. So thank you again for being in here. Uh, we are excited. Uh, New Testament characters. And uh, I, I got a text last night. And uh, it's kind of, you know, doing the introduction. How do, you introdu how do you introduce this? Well, you know what? My good friend Kelly Hope did it for me. Uh, he sent Joey and I a text. I know this was for more for Ams than me. No, I'm kidding. It was for me, me too. He says, I'm excited about your class tomorrow. Been praying for you, uh, both of you, to lead the class and learn real people who lived on how God directed each. I know you both will do great. And so I took a little phrase out of there. I think he summed it up best. Is he said, learn about real people who lived and how God directed each. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So thank you, brother, for sending that, because you did my intro for me. But that's, that's what the whole thing is going to be about. We're going to look at individuals, sometimes individuals who aren't studied that much, and they're just like you and I. Sometimes we look at some of these New Testament characters, we look at Peter, and we're like, oh, Peter, Peter had so much more of everything than I had. No, he didn't. He's no different than you sitting in this classroom right now. Um, and, and all these characters, these real people, living life, having the same trials, having the same things that all of us go through. And we're going we're gonna to have a glimpse into their life. We're going to see how they handle things that they went on. Now, except for the very first one here, and some people have probably seen the very first one we're going to talk about this morning is, um, is Satan. And I kind of chose this one to start with. Uh, a little bit, people to go, wow, he's, starting, he's going to start with Satan. Um, it kind of worked. My, I did it with my wife, and she was like, well, why aren't you starting with Jesus? And I said, well, because I want to start with Satan. I think this would be a good place to start. Uh, but also I want to start with Satan because it's just not something that's studied a whole lot, to be honest. Is um, as, as, as my whole time being a Christian and going to worship service, I cannot think of having a class on Satan, which is why in the high school class, they are studying this book this quarter. It's called The Devil, Demons, and Angels. It just came out uh, by Jeff, uh, Jeff Archer. So uh, I did reference quite a bit of uh, material from here. I took two sources today. Uh, this is one of those. You want to pick it up? It's at One Stone for $6.99. I am getting money off of advertising for that, so please purchase it. Thank you um, for that. Uh, but, but you can pick that up. But anyway, I thought that that was a good book for them, and I think it's something for us to think about. Uh, the, the devil and Satan and uh, how he interacts in our life. And it's definitely a New Testament character. All the way through the New Testament is all in there. I uh, referenced uh, probably a hundred times. I didn't add them all up. When we look at the name, I think it's 37 times mentioned, 36 times, and then there's other times mentioned. So probably almost a hundred times mentioned. The Holy Spirit chose a hundred times, almost a hundred times, um, to talk about Satan and to reference him throughout the entire text. So must be something that's pretty important um, if it's there. 
I, I thought this was interesting. These are some t- statistics. Uh, last time I had some statistics, my wife reminded me that nobody could read them or see them, so I blew them up for you. And so here in 2014, there was a study done, and I found that this study was really, really interesting. Total people that believed in hell were 58% of all people surveyed. Yet 72% of people believe in heaven. I always find that odd. It seems to me if you believe in heaven, you would equally believe in hell. But that's not the case. I also found it interesting here about the different uh, demographics here of different churches. So Protestant, 75% believe in hell, 86 in heaven. And doesn't that surprise you that religious people don't 100% believe in heaven? I just, anyway, that may just be me weird looking at this. But anyway, there you go. Uh, evangelicals, 75%, or uh, evangelicals, 82%. Uh, historically, uh, uh, black churches are, are, are here, 82%. Catholics, uh, only 63% believe. Orthodox Christian, only 59% believe. Jehovah's Witness, only 7%, according to this survey, believe in hell. So when I look at stats like this, I see 58% only believe in hell. Well, man, maybe, maybe we need to be telling people a lot more about hell and letting them realize that this is a real place. And 72% overall only believe in heaven. And so maybe that's something we should do as well. Now, when you break these stats down a little bit here, non-Christian faiths, 31%. Jewish, 22% believe in hell. Muslims, 76% and 89 there for heaven and hell. Atheists, obviously, only 3% believe in hell, 5% uh, believe in heaven. I'm surprised the atheist has any percentages there, but yet they do. Um, and then you can see on here and on. I think due to these statistics of people that we're studying with, and even Christians that we see here that call themselves religious, don't believe in heaven and hell. And if you don't believe in, in hell, you probably don't believe in uh, the devil either. Belief in hell overall here, another study, 58% believe in it. 34% don't believe in it. 8% just don't know what they believe, if there's one or not. And so you can see there, when we look at the, the United States and we look at people that are religious, we have a large percentage of people that don't even believe in hell at all. Which to me is a good reason why we should study this. Because according to the Bible, it is a real place and it is a place um, that some will go to. Um, when we look here, um, in, uh, in the devil, uh, believe in, 70% in this study believe in the devil, yet only 69% believe in, in hell. This is a 2007 study, and yet there were 21% that don't believe in the devil at all, and 22% don't even believe that there is a hell. And you can see God is 86%, yet most people in this study believe there is a God. So you can see here, enough stats probably, Uh, pointing out here a good reason why we should study this. But I can give you a better reason why we should study this. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, if you did not know this, it says here, be sober, be a sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is happening 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, an extra day during leap year, every 4 years. Satan is roaring around like a lion here, seeking someone to devour. Everyone, I'm sure, has seen those episodes on National Geographic or some nature. where You see the lion laying down and you've got some animal, a gazelle or whatever it is. And what does it do? It sits and watches and lays down and watches and sits and watches and yawns and sits and watches and, and, and sits for hours just sitting there watching. And what is it waiting for? One mishap, one mistake, one baby getting too far from its mother, one opportunity for someone to get separated. And then what does it do? Pounces. Isn't it interesting here that in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it uses that same terminology to tell you what the de- devil is doing. The devil is sitting around and watching all of us. 
watching us right now, watching us here in this class, watching you every day, sitting, laying down, just waiting and looking, waiting for that opportunity to pounce. This is why 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, Be a soul spirit, be on alert. There are other texts talk about not being deceived. I think this is a good place to do that. Do not be deceived. Satan is looking for every opportunity to come out and to attack, to destroy, uh, to seek someone to devour. The question is, are we putting ourselves in a position... Question might even be better. Are we helping him out? Are you making it too easy for him? Are you making it difficult for him each day? Now, I'm going to pause here and say I like interaction. Any question I don't know the answer to goes to Johnny Montgomery. Any question I want to answer, then I will answer it. Otherwise, if Johnny doesn't answer it, I'll find somebody else to answer it. But I do like uh, communication. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, so First Peter chapter 5. So we're going to look at some names of Satan that are in the text. We know there are all different kinds of names that are represented for him. And so here um, we will look at those. Uh, the first one here that we see is Satan in the New Testament. That is one that is, uh, is out there. It is mentioned 36 times in the New Testament. We are not going to look at all 36. I have 46 slides to get through in 45 minutes. That'd be 70, 81 slides, and we do not have time for that. But 36 times in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11. But one whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I do so for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. And so we see the actual terminology used for Satan here in the New Testament mentioned 36 times. And so that's one way that Satan is described uh, in the New Testament. Um, and then look at here in Job 1 7, just an Old Testament description here. The Lord said to Satan, as it is translated, um, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about the earth and walking around on it. So we see the terminology even used in the Old Testament for Satan. Um, Job chapter 1 will be your homework on Wednesday, so we're not going to dive into this, more of an introductory on Satan. Um, I did have the whole section up there, and then I'm like, wow, we'll go on a tangent here, and, and we'll definitely study Job chapter 1 on, uh, on Wednesday night. So we see here that the Lord said to Satan, so a reference to his name. Another name is the devil. And, I, you know, I want to go back and give you the definition there. Uh, Satan, one who lives in, in wait, lives in wait, lives in wait, adversary. And I might have typed that wrong, but adversary, one who lives in wait, one who's ready to, to, to pounce. You know, it's interesting that that 1 Peter 5, 8 passage goes uh, and talks about that. We see here the devil. What is he called here? Devil, the slander, accuser. You know, maybe a, a better term here, you know, in elementary school, a tattletale. No, I'm kidding. That may not be the right term here, but... Slander, someone who's lying against you, someone who's accusing, someone who's, who's just constantly making stuff up, someone um, who is, is slandering. 1 Peter 5, 8 here uses the word the devil, the slanderer, this accuser as a name. So we've got the word Satan, we've got the word devil. The next one here we see in Revelation 12, 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of Christ has come. The accuser of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down. The one who accuses them before you, uh, God, day and night. The accuser, uh, the devil. I think that's interesting terminology used for him. 
Another name for Satan is the tempter. The tempter. Uh, Matthew 4, 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. You ever thought about that? Satan, the devil, is known as the tempter. He's roaming the earth, looking for someone to tempt. It's all he does, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days in a year. Is going around and looking for these opportunities to tempt. He's the tempter. First Thessalonians 3, 5, For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I also sent and found and find out about your faith for fears that the tempter might have tempted you and our labors would be for nothing. The tempter, tempting. And so, you know, that another phrase here, thinking about the devil and what he does. <clears throat> another name for Satan is prince of the power of the air. Prince of the of the power of the air. Ephesians 2, two, In which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. found that one really interesting. Satan, the devil, looked at the prince of the power of the air. Another one, the God of the age, also translated the God of the world. Notice lowercase God there. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And so Satan, the devil, the God of this world, has blinded those minds of unbelieving. So we see him referenced here as the God of the age, the God of the world. And so another name here that you might not have thought about uh, for Satan. And the last one here, the names for Satan, the ruler of the world. John 12, 31, now judgment upon this world, now the ruler of the world of this world will be cast out. And so some names there for the devil. One here is not seen. I will talk about it on the last slide. Um, is, anybody know, which one do you not see up there? Lucifer. Lucifer is not technically mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Um, I know that's one that we use. Um, it is uh, referenced in Isaiah. Uh, some have translated the falling star in Isaiah. The King James has transferred, translated that as Lucifer. There's some debate about that. We'll talk about Ezekiel and Isaiah uh, next to the last slide. Um, but uh, that was something that the King James did. But nowhere in the text do we see that. And yet we uh, use that word Lucifer quite a bit. I thought that one uh, was quite interesting. How that's not there. So this next section here, as we look at the names, I thought about what does Satan look like? And uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's just have some thought on that. So I'm going to throw it out. What does Satan look like? Anybody? Angel of light. All right. Anyone else on what Satan looks like? Any thoughts on that? All right, well, this one, this one is, is uh, actually uh, where I want to spend a lot of time this morning. What does Satan look like? Well, you know, when I was in, like, third grade, I went trick-or-treating. I dressed up in a costume that looked like this. I'm not sure why I did that. My parents, I don't know why. My parents were very strict, but it was okay to dress up like Satan. I don't really understand that, but I did. Is this what Satan looks like? I mean, if that's what Satan looks like, we would see Satan, we would go, that's Satan. Crawling around, roaring on the earth, going from end to end, avoid him. That'd be pretty easy, wouldn't it, Doug? I mean, you'd see it, you'd be like, that's Satan, that's pretty easy, 
Um, we could, we, we, we would know, kids, avoid the red guy with the horns. If you do that, your life's going to be good. Um, I'm afraid so many times that this is the image right here that we, we come up with in our minds about what Satan looks like. And so we don't see that, and we're like, hey, I'm good. I didn't see the red guy with horns. So life is good. Hmm, I don't know. Sometimes we're like, that's what Satan looks like. That's a better image. That's what, he's that dragon-looking, wing, rough, ugly-looking guy. He doesn't have any horns. This is a better image of Satan. So avoid that, and you're going to be okay. Is that, is that what Satan looks like? I don't know. Well, maybe. Maybe that's what Satan looks like. That, maybe that's a better. Maybe he really does look like a man, but, but he lives in a fiery place, so his skin's all kind of melted and burned, and may not have any horns to be red, but, but he kind of has this burned fleshly look. So when you see that, avoid, avoid this guy. Is that what Satan looks like as he's walking around? I don't know. Maybe that's what Satan looks like. He's got kind of fiery eyes and flames coming out of it, and you know he has that deep voice, and it's kind of demonic, and, and there's fire coming out of his eyes. And, and when you see that, that's what you avoid, because that's what Satan looks like, and we don't want to be around, around Satan. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe this is what Satan looks like, because it's a TV show that just came out, which I have not watched, and they said, this is what Lucifer looks like, and that's how they depict him. Uh, which I find is a very ironic TV show, but I'm not going to go on a tangent here. But is that what Satan looks like? That guy's not red. He doesn't have any horns. He's not got burned skin. He doesn't have flame coming out of his eyes. Is that what Satan looks like? What does Satan look like? <clears throat> he looks like none of these. Yet he looks like all of these. What does Satan look like? Satan comes in many different ways and forms and images and everything. We look in the text. He's a serpent. He, 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 he comes. He, he tempts us. There, there is all kinds of ways, and I was going to throw a million different images up right now to show you what Satan is, but Satan can, can look in any form or fashion. He's none of them, but he could be all of them. He could be anything, anywhere, anytime. He could have any look and present himself any way that he wants to. 2 Corinthians 11, 2-3. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealous, for I am <clears throat> betrothed you, to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion from Christ. I like the word there, trickery. Trickery. He can be a sheep in, wolf, a sheep in wolf's clothing. He can come to you in any form or fashion, in any way, and present himself. I'm pretty sure, though, if anybody wants to disagree with me on this one, I'll, I'll accept the debate on it, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't show up and go, knock, 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 knock. Uh, hello, Clint. This is Satan. I would like to tempt you. Is that okay with you? Has anybody ever had that happen? Because I haven't. Satan will show up in many different forms and in many different ways in your life and will look and have an image any way that you could possibly think of. And I could present you a million different images to, to show that. Any questions or comments on this section? Anything anybody wants to add to this? Mr. Ams in the back. You know, I think it's interesting. We, it compares him to a roaring lion. And... You know, last night we were sitting around with some friends and we was looking at some pictures from when I went to South Africa. And I'm sitting there petting a, ba a, uh, a lion cub. You know, this thing's four months old. It's about the size of a normal house dog. And, you know, it just looks like a fluffy kitten to you at that point. Well, 
the thing is, it, it, that would make you want to keep petting that kitten. Well, two months from then, they said they would have to put the, the uh, dogs away from them because they'd start killing the dogs. You know, they're playing with them at one moment. A few months from then, it's going to be killing them. And, you know, I told them also, you know, at the same time, when we take the animals into the skinning shed, you're 30 feet away from the fence where these big lions are just sitting there walking, pacing back and forth, watching these animals being skinned out, thinking they're getting ready to get a meal. And when you start reading these verses and you think about it that way, you know, the, Satan's just looking for the opportune moment to, to have a feast. You know, most of the time when you see those lions, they're just laying underneath a shade tree, just waiting. They're not waiting for the fastest, the, the strongest, the best. They're just waiting for an opportunity. Whatever it is that comes through, most of the time it's going to be the weakest, the slowest, the ones that are lame, the ones that are maybe straying away from the crowd. And that's the ones he's going after. And I think that's, that hits home right now. That's what this is all about. This class is going to be about what do these characters mean to me? And when we read this verse and we see the ones that are straying away from us right now, that won't come to the services, that won't study their Bible, that are falling away, yeah, there's a roaring lion at your door and it's coming after you. That's what we need to be worried about. That's why we need to study these characters and understand what it is the Bible is telling us about them. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, so, so I, I, I find this very interesting to me because I think sometimes we, we look at Satan and we, we, we feel like that when he comes, we'll know. Like, we'll be like, oh, that's Satan right there. And, and we got to realize that he's a deceiver. He's a liar. Um, he has trickery. Um, he has all different kinds of things. Uh, right here, LR. I think I'm working now. Am I working now? I was just going to say... But one of the things Satan does of trickery, he even tries to delude himself, delude us, that he doesn't exist. And I think it goes back to what your statistics were talking about earlier, is we have so many video games and so many things that occupy our TV and, and electronics that occupy us, that deceive us, that he wants to deceive us, so people don't even think he exists. And if he got you thinking he doesn't exist, he's got you nailed. And so now part of our job as Christians, we have to not only convince people that heaven exists, we have to convince them that hell exists and, and show that proof. So that's what the, one of, he's, a, he's perfect at marketing and PR because he's doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So, if, so if, if hell doesn't exist and Satan doesn't exist, then, you know, well, oh well. You know, what, what kind of thing is there to do if... If, you know, that's just kind of like saying if there's, you know, if prison doesn't exist and judges don't exist and executions don't exist, I can do whatever I want to, right? Because there's no punishment um, for what I do. And so we know that's not the case. So anyway, I want us to be thinking about that in our lives and think about how Satan comes to us and how he works and how he comes in different forms and images in different ways. Uh, John 8, 44, you are the father, uh, uh, you are your father, the devil. And you want to do the, the, the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of liars. Wow! Wouldn't you hate to be described that way, first of all? Um, from the beginning, he's a murderer. He does not stand in any truth. He tells a lie. He speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of liars. So if, if Satan is speaking, <laughs> what's a good chance he's doing? He's lying. He's lying. He's trying to convince you and talk you into and get you to do something or try to persuade or deceive or do something. He is the liar of all liars. And I think when you think about it that way, he cannot be trusted in any way, any, any way at all. And that's here how he is described. So, Satan is whatever he needs to be. And that's it. Whatever he needs to be, to whomever he needs to be, however he needs to be, whenever he needs to be. And I think we always have to be aware of that. Um, as I'm thinking right now, I kind of wish I had a whole section here to add in here, but... You know, things that are happening in your life, 
sometimes we don't want to do it, and I hate to, I hate to always question everything, but, but is this of Satan? Is this coming from Satan? Is this of Satan? Or is this, is this of God? And I think as we, we reflect in our life, maybe it's a good thing to kind of constantly be kind of looking and evaluating um, um, that and, and to kind of see is, is what's happening, where is this coming from? Is this something coming from Satan uh, that's being put out before me? And, and we see, and I'm, I don't have this up here, but we look in James, James chapter 1. Could be James chapter 2. My memory's not getting as well. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he's being tempted. Remember, Satan's name is the tempter. I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Who do you think, who do you think, who, who do you think helps entice? Uh, Curtis Pope's very first sermon here, I think, was about the fishing lure sermon. I, I, I thought that was a really cool sermon about the lures that are put out. You know, fish, different fish bite different lures. Uh, they like lures. What lure are you being enticed by? What fishing lure here? And then verse 15, Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Satan becomes any lure... Any way to entice, any way to do it. God's not tempting. God's not the one doing that. We see that Satan is the tempter, and he's the one that's tempting. All right. Uh, clicker's not working anymore. There we go. Um, the origin of Satan. Now, this is one that, that uh, you know, there's debate about and there's talk about. So... Uh, one of my classes uh, in my biblical studies classes is always talk about the difficult topics. Don't be afraid to talk about them. So we're going to talk about, I don't think it's so difficult, but we're going we're to talk about where did Satan come from, uh, where is the origin, and uh, we'll answer the questions that we know, and we'll leave the ones we don't know unanswered because we don't have biblical text to answer that. So the origin of Satan, uh, there was an article here that I looked at. I, I did some information through here and there and then, you know, text. I thought this was a really good article, Who Made Satan? I don't know a lot about this guy, but I thought it was a good read. And uh, so some of the points here I took from this, and then, and then we'll add to it. But um, who made Satan? That's a good question. Um, first of all, from the text, God created him. And so we see here in Colossians 1, 15 through 18, it says here, He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation, for him by all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. I think it's pretty clear there that anything and everything and all things, I don't know how you could use any more words to describe it, but everything that exists has existed because God created in the heavens and in the earth and everything that's there. So where did he come from? I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where exactly, but I know God created everything according to Colossians 1, 15 through 18. Also, here in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, we see that everything that God created, He created good. And I think that's something that's interesting to think about. Because I think the first thing in your mind is, is if He created Satan, and Satan's evil, then God created something that was evil, right? I mean, that's how you begin to break it down. But 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. So all things that God created... We're good. God created everything, and God created everything good. And I think that is really interesting when you begin to think about this um, and everything that's, that's done. Some created angels rebelled against God. Okay? Now this is where it starts getting a little more fuzzy here, but we know in 2 Peter 2, 4, 
For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness held for judgment. So he's talking here. He says, for God did not spare angels when they sinned. I have to admit, I don't know what he's talking about here. But I know he says angels, and I know that there's a place and when they sinned. But what does that tell me about angels, though? Let's open that up real quick. What does that tell us about angels? They can sin, but what else? They may choose. They have free will. You know, that is the most amazing thing when you think about God. God created everything, it seems like, that he created, angels and, and humans, with free will. They, everybody has a choice. Isn't that interesting? You know, God could have created us all not to have a choice. He could have said, and you're going to worship me. All of you, all eight billion, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. Could God have done that? Absolutely, he could have. But it looks like everything in his creation that he created, they had opportunities to choose. They had free will. Even the angels had free will here. And I think that is pretty amazing here. So he created everything, he created everything good, and he created everything here. Uh, free will. And so we see that angels rebel. Don't know much more than this about that, uh, but we see that here. Some created angels rebelled against God. Jude seems like an odd place to go to talk about the devil, but Jude 6 refers to it here. And angels who did not keep their own uh, domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So Jude here references this, is that those who were rebelled were kept in eternal restraints under the darkness of the judgment uh, for the great day. And so we see that some abandoned their proper dwelling place. Well, where do you think their proper dwelling place would have been here? Bowling Green, Kentucky. Heaven, very good, very good. And unfortunately, they are not there. And he sent them somewhere, and we can allude here that it's hell. Yeah, LR. God, God exercised his free will himself. He didn't have to send his son. He yeah. chose to send his son for us. Yeah. We yet sinners. Christ died for us. Yeah, ab absolutely. LR says that we all could have been condemned. God um, loved us so much, John 3, that he sent his only begotten son. To provide an avenue for us to have forgiveness of our sins. And that's not what John 3, 6 says, but I'm, I'm putting all that together there. And so you're right. He offered free will here. So we see some created angels rebelled against God, and so they were sent here. And so that's what we see there. And then Satan's evil came from within himself. Isn't that interesting? So where did it come? Why did he become evil? Where did it come from? Going back to this John 8, passage here, it says, You are the father of the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He chose. Uh, and does not stand in truth because there's no truth in you. Whenever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. So he chose this avenue. It was a choice he made. And from the beginning, this is what he decided he wanted to do. And so we see Satan, we see the devil, and we see uh, where he's at. And so these are the origins that we know. Um, we see here, uh, what about the morning star, or Lucifer? And the King James translates here uh, the morning star as Lucifer, so that's where we get that uh, word there, that's where we get that text. Now, when we get into Ezekiel and Isaiah, you know, it gets a little crazy, uh, and you could spend years and years and years talking about Ezekiel and maybe years talking about Isaiah. Um, but I thought it was interesting that one of the, one of the commentators, um, what they did with the text. So you've got Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 is the text a lot of people go to. And you've got Ezekiel 28, 1 through 19, uh, which refers here to Satan and Lucifer. 
And so here in Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through 15, which is a passage that's, that's referenced here, he says, How have you fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, or Lucifer, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to earth. You, you have defeated the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, and I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the Mount of Simile in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like most high. Nevertheless, you will be brought down to Sheol to the recesses of the pit. Now, I'm not here to debate whether this is talking about that or not. People kind of split on this. Uh, but I did find it interesting here that in this same text, if you go up to verse 4, it says here that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased and how the onslaught has, uh, has ceased. And so some would say this whole text here is talking to um, the king of Babylon. Some have argued that no, 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 this is talking about Lucifer or Satan, and this is how he fell, and this is where he fell there. Uh, I don't have that answer for you, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to present the information uh, for you there, and I'm going to open it up. I probably shouldn't do this, but maybe it'll be okay. Any thoughts anybody has around this particular section of Isaiah and Ezekiel in this reference? Got a question in the back? Yeah, uh, wouldn't God know what was going to take place before it happened? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yep. David? When I consider things like this, I always remember Deuteronomy 29, 29. Okay. Which says the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. You know, I don't know everything there is to know about the origin of Satan. I agree with you. I think he's created. God created everything. Um, but what I do know is what scripture, even Jesus Christ himself, warns about Satan. And... Uh, Ultimately, every choice we make is either to obey God or it's to obey Satan. We choose who we obey. We choose the one to whom we will be a slave. And um, there's no question about what the right choice is. Uh, no question at all about that. But we're responsible for the choices that we make. Every single one from the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve. Um, Adam tried to blame Eve for his sin, then Eve said the, that the serpent deceived me. Uh, God held all three of them accountable. Uh, and um, he is going to hold us accountable in the very same way. So it's important for us to understand who our adversary is. It is even more important for us to understand what, the, what Scripture, what it teaches us about how to um, combat that adversary. God's given us very effective tools to do that. We just have to be the one to pick up the, ar the battle armor and put it on and put it to use. Yeah, excellent point. And, and something I want to emphasize here, if God gives us free will and we have choice, then doesn't that mean when Satan comes to us that we have free will and we have choice too? Absolutely, 100% of the time. Uh, Satan, Satan can't force us to do anything just like God doesn't force us to do anything either. Well, in Ezekiel, if, it, if it's talking about Satan, he is uh, looked upon as being beautiful, okay? He is beautiful to our eye because he's appealing, okay? If he was not appealing what he was selling, we wouldn't be interested in, Okay? Now, when we get down to the core, it's rotten to the core. But he is he's beautiful. He's very smart. Okay? He knows what Gerald Barr likes. Okay? Now, the, the one thing that how God helps us is Gerald Barr knows what Gerald Barr likes. Okay? So it, it's like the old saying about the dog on a chain. How close do you want to get to the chain? But, but I mean, 
I can remember when I was in school, uh, we made rat poison in FFA. Less than 10% of what you put in there is poison. Most of it is good stuff that rats really like to eat. And that's how he uses his devices. But he's very smart and he is beautiful. If he was dumb and, and, and terrible looking, he wouldn't have any appeal. Well, we wouldn't want to do anything with it. Yep. Nothing. Okay, homework. I want you to read Genesis chapter 3, Job chapter 1, and Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. We're going to do application on Wednesday night. So we're going to go through and we're going to see how Satan works. We're going to see how people dealt and handled with Satan. And then we're going to see what we can learn from these three passages. So come ready to discuss. Uh, please look in detail in these three passages. See you guys on Wednesday night. Thank you so much.